everyone for being here. It's a pleasure to see everyone this morning. Uh, and uh, thank Gordon especially for asking me to participate uh, this morning in the Docker Studio <coughs> Consortium. Uh, hopefully, uh, next few minutes, what I'll be talking about is really just kind of speculation. Uh, so I won't really talk that much about existing research. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do is talk about just some things that I think could be important uh, and are areas that you know enterprising young people like yourselves uh, might want to actually take a look at and see if maybe there is something there uh, that could be interesting uh, going forward. So this is going to be corporate governance, so I'm going to deviate a little bit from corporate finance, uh, which Gordon already talked about, and uh, which touched on a couple of the themes that I might touch on a little bit, uh, but I'm going to try to go, as I said, in directions that are a little bit different uh, than what you probably see mostly in the literature uh, at this point. Okay, so I'm going to talk about three areas specifically. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about executive compensation, so that's, that's what's up here first. Uh, but the second thing that I'm going to talk about is boards of directors and information flows. Uh, and, and specifically, I'm going to really focus on the empirical side of things because that's really where there's an opportunity to make uh, a lot of progress. Uh, so in all the areas that I'm going to talk about, there's already been some theoretical work, uh, some theory that's been done. Uh, but there's a lot of scope uh, for empirical work still. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So the second one's going to be uh, boards of directors. And then the last one is going to be nonprofits. So, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about commercial nonprofits. I'll talk about what those are uh, in a little more detail when I get there. But these are kind of three areas that I think uh, have some scope for interesting things to be done. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to talk about what those are as we go along. So the first one uh, is executive compensation. They're kind of all sorts of theories uh, already that are out there uh, about executive compensation. A lot of this stuff you've already seen. Uh, a lot of things put in a principal agent framework. Uh, you can call that optimal contracting. When I talk about traditional optimal contracting, I'm really thinking about sort of the effort insurance uh, type of model uh, that we're all very, very familiar with going back to Holmstrom uh, and prior work uh, even there than that. Uh, I'm also going to talk just quickly about rent extraction. Uh, and then kind of a combination of a bunch of things, which I'm just going to kind of call bird behavior. I'm going to lump it all uh, together. And I'll, I'll talk about all of these and then kind of try to point you uh, to what I think is kind of an interesting and open question uh, that perhaps should be explored a little bit further. And Gordon, you're going to tell me when I need to stop, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you got 18. Go. 18? Okay. Plenty of time. Uh, okay. So, uh, the optimal contract review is something that's kind of dominated uh, the literature when it comes to executive compensation. Uh, I've written a lot of papers uh, that sort of take this perspective. Uh, and at this point, uh, I'm not sure that we should really believe it, right? That I'm not sure that this is necessarily the right lens to look at things like executive compensation uh, in the literature. So I'm not sure that the standard principal agent framework is the best way uh, to approach this problem, right? So, uh, yeah, there are a lot of things one can point to. There are a lot of uh, sort of, there's lots of pieces of evidence. Uh, but one recent piece of evidence I think is pretty interesting. Uh, there's this survey that's been done by Edmunds, Gosling, and Genter, uh, which shows that boards and CEOs respond to significant non-pecuniary pressures and constraints, right? Um, so there, if you kind of think about sort of the structure of the way compensation is set, it's not specifically or not even primarily about pay for performance, although that's very, very important, right? But there are a whole bunch of other considerations that really matter. The one that they highlight, which I think is just fascinating, is fairness, right? And what do we mean by fairness? I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. But you can think about internal fairness you know, between, say, the CEO and top executives or CEO and other members or other employees at the firm. You can think about across executives, so across firms, uh, so executives across firms, right? So you can think about uh, all sorts of questions about fairness and then fairness within society as well, right? Uh, and, and you might think, okay, well, this sounds like socialism, so, so why do we care? Uh, but these are actually very, very real constraints that really do seem to shape what's actually happening out there when it comes to setting up contracts, how people are getting rewarded, Right? And so as observers, as empiricists, right, we need to take that seriously. Right? So what specifically are the things 
that matter, how do we incorporate that into the type of work that we're doing? So fairness and really seems to matter. The rate extraction view, uh, I think, has been quite quite popular uh, in the past 20 years. Has a lot of merit to it. Uh, so, but if you kind of take the uh, sort of extreme version of the pet shop and freed story, right? You kind of expect it would be rampant inefficiency and waste, uh, you know, in terms of compensation. Maybe what they would argue is that's actually what's happening. There's, there's massive inefficiency and waste. CEOs are extracting massive amounts of rent, right? But that's also a little bit hard to square with the fact that if you look long term, shareholder returns, at least in the US, have been quite high, right? So maybe there is all this rent extraction, but it seems to kind of work, right? You seem to actually get good outcomes uh, in at least publicly traded companies, right? And so that's, that's kind of the point that Holmstrom and Kaplan make. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's something to think about. Uh, all right, last uh, kind of story that I'll just mention here, uh, where I lump, I'm lumping a bunch of things together, is about kind of deferred behavior. And this is kind of also part of rent extraction, also part of optimal contracting, uh, but it has kind of some features that I think are worth thinking about. So it's consistent with a lot of evidence on peer groups, <coughs> benchmarking, use of compensation consultants, asymmetric use of relative performance evaluation, right? All of these things kind of fit together with the kind of idea that essentially all firms are doing the same thing, right? And so this allows CEOs, other executives to be paid what they're paid, right? Because basically that's just the comparison, right? And so everybody winds up doing the same thing, all right? And so you could just sort of say, all right, this might explain why pay isn't necessarily all that linked to performance. Uh, and you can also say, you know, but given that people have intrinsic motivation, people actually do want to work hard, right, regardless of, or at least want to be successful, uh, you know, regardless of how much they're being paid, right, uh, you know, their career concerns, other implicit incentives, all these things can explain good outcomes along with high pay that's not necessarily linked to explicit pecuniary incentives. Okay, so, so this, this kind of story uh, can make sense, all right? And so what I would say is just, uh, you know, over the past 20 years, we've moved away from explicit incentives. Uh, and the kind of thing that I would want to highlight, highlight here is that incorporating issues such as fairness, it's a really promising direction for finance research, right? And again, fairness you can think about as, you know, is it fair that the CEO at company A is paid less than the CEO at company B, right? You can think about it as, is it fair that the CEO uh, is paid more, or dramatically more, than other top executives at her firm? Uh, is it fair that the CEO is definitely paid dramatically more than the median worker uh, at her firm, all right? And by the way, there's been research on all of these things, right? I mean, we know that there's disclosure uh, now about you know, the ratio of CEO pay to average worker pay, or median worker pay. We know that you know, there's been work done on what's called the CEO pay slice, right? which is you know, how much the CEO is getting paid relative to the entire top management team. right? Uh, so, so we know that. And of course, we know that there's lots of pure benchmarking uh, when it comes to what CEOs get paid. Right? And you, know, you can ask, right? has that been due to something like, say, a ratchet effect, right? where just CEO pay gets higher and higher, simply because the comparison group is <coughs> chosen uh, kind of optimally. All right, but the, the thing I want to kind of emphasize here, all right, is we know that's been done, right? But, but kind of the thing that I think about is just when you think about pay disparities, right? You think about pay disparities, especially <coughs> within a firm, right? That says something about corporate culture, right? And there's uh, a lot that we have not yet done really trying to take into account fairness or culture uh, when we really try to think about how well firms perform. So for example, corporate culture that emphasizes greater fairness, over the long run, does that perform better, right? Well, we have a lot of evidence that says high-powered incentives lead to good outcomes, but another thought here, think about the fact that we get a lot of those outcomes because there's an interaction between high-powered incentives and limited liability. Right? And where this shows up kind of most explicitly uh, is in private equity, in leveraged buyouts, where you have ultra-high-powered incentives 
but it's also very easy for LBO firms to walk away. All right, and so there is potentially quite a lot that can be thought about in terms of comparing different types of corporate cultures, especially along the dimension of fairness uh, when it comes to incentives, right, and whether or not those actually lead to better or worse outcomes. Okay, so that's one. Second one I want to talk about, boards of directors. Okay, so lots of work on boards of directors, lots of work on corporate governance on this topic, but I want to focus on what I consider to be the central tension when it comes to boards. And I'll say up front, a lot of work on the theory side has emphasized this for obvious reasons, which I'll get to in a second, a lot less work on the empirical side. And the, the obvious reason is it's super hard to find good ways to talk about or measure uh, the things that I'm about to mention, okay? All right, so a lot of research is focused on internal board dysfunction, uh, you know, things like large boards or busy boards, uh, you know, so you know, a large board's worse because, you know, people free ride, uh, and so don't really have, you know, strong incentives to monitor, busy boards are people distracted, all right? But what I can say is this, this, this is the primary problem for boards, as you should have. Wow. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, so plenty of time. All right. Uh, all right. So this this is kind of the primary problem for boards. All right. Which is boards receive their information directly from management. All right. And this information is typically biased. All right. So if you think about the average board of directors, they can get some external signals, right, from the stock market uh, or analysts or whatever. All right. Uh, but most of the information they're going to get is directly from management. Okay? And this information is typically going to be biased. Right? Uh, you know, no manager wants to say, I've done really poorly for the past three months. Right? Um, ideally, what you would like to be able to say is, I've done very well, or I've done very well on these dimensions, I'm going to not talk about these other dimensions over here. Uh, and so it's going to be that sort of thing. Uh, that typically is going to happen. So there's going to be, if you like, immediate or rapid revelation of good news, right, and slow or no revelation of bad news. Okay, so the information is naturally quite biased uh, in terms of what boards are going to get. All right, and so the other point that I want to make, because uh, I think this is kind of critical uh, to really understand why this problem is so central. Right, you know, you can think about hard information, soft. Right? Well, part information, that's really easy, right? Verifiable, easily transmitted, all of those good things, right? For boards, the stuff that's really critical is going to be the soft information, right? So information about strategy, information about personnel, okay? And I'll talk about a couple of those ideas in a minute, right? It's going to be things like that, right? Things that are harder to transmit, okay? And so you don't want to really say, you know, my exciting new strategy is actually failing this year, <coughs> right? So that's just like not the type of thing that managers want to reveal to boards, okay? All right, so what do we know? Well, we know in soft information environments, delegation to management by the board is going to be optimal. That's a paper by Stein, right? So basic idea, management obviously knows a lot more than does the board, right? Uh, that information is not easily conveyed, right? And even though the information is biased, it's typically going to be better to delegate decision making to management from the board, right? So the board is responsible, but better to delegate, right? But, you know, that's the trade off. Bias by management is going to have to be accepted because management is better than the board, all right? So potentially getting some worsening of decision making, uh, but you accept that because that's what the information is. All right? And, and I just want to point out that there are a whole bunch of things that can make this problem. Worse, right? So board independence makes this problem worse. Uh, delegation may be optimal due to management being better informed, being better informed. But this is also going to be then be reinforced by the fact that uh, the board can be captured. Uh, other trade-offs: boards advise CEOs, and so the CEO is going to provide the board information. Right? That's going to improve advising, so the board, CEO might want to do it. But it's also going to improve monitoring, and that's going to risk the CEO being fired. The CEO really doesn't like that. Okay. So uh, point here, theory is really focused on a bunch of these ex-ante mechanisms or a bunch of ex-ante mechanisms to induce the revelation of information uh, or ex-post remedies. Okay. So there's, there's been a lot of work 
done good. There's a great survey by uh, Nadia Malenko uh, on the theory side, all right? Um, and so, you know, just lots of good stuff there, but not a lot has been done on the empirical side. Uh, and one other last thing, uh, you know, oftentimes when you think about monitoring, you think about being reversed. That's, that's not how monitoring works. Monitoring in practice involves firing the CEO, okay? Because that's typically really the only remedy uh, in situations where you think bias is extreme. All right, so, so, uh, let's see, am I doing? I'm gonna skip this. Uh, you can see it later. All right, um, so what I want to get to uh, instead is to really talk about kind of what are some of the empirical issues that come up and what can be done, all right? So what do I think is really interesting here, all right? So, yeah, you know, we kind of think the board structure and diversity in the board in terms of perspectives, et cetera, can, can be useful Right, can be helpful, all right, but it's not clear yet why. All right, so it could be the case that things like you know diversity might better surface dissent, it might mitigate co-option. Um, you know, we've got the usual endogeneity challenges. So you know, we kind of need uh, a lot of work to kind of help with pinning down mechanisms. All right, I want to just kind of take this all as given, and the question that I really could get to is the following: As econometricians, how are we going to observe the hidden information? that management does not reveal to the board, how do we identify board actions taken either before or after in response to the fact that there is all of this hidden information? Uh, and so, uh, one of the things I really want to kind of leverage is that, you know, there is a robust literature <coughs> on CEO dismissals, right? Uh, and CEO dismissals, CEO firings, right? That's, that's really going to be kind of the, real end state of board monitoring, right? So if the board really figures out that the information's been really biased, that they've gotten, right, the end state there is typically going to be uh, CEO firing, okay? And so uh, basically what is gonna be kind of the key question here is, is how do you link dismissals uh, to information flows, all right? Now, there's also this huge unobserved piece, which is, you know, there could be biased information that didn't lead to dismissals, okay? So that's also something that we need to take into account. Okay, uh, before I get to nonprofits, let me just say a couple of quick things uh, that I think are interesting and potentially promising uh, for how to think about this in here. I didn't put it on a slide. All right, so uh, the first is that the accountants are actually far ahead of finance faculty, finance professors, uh, when it comes to thinking about these issues. And the reason why is that you know, they can look at things like accounting of these statements, you know, situations in which internal controls or audits uh, or other information that's directly relevant to financial reporting uh, has been misstated, right, or is biased. Okay? So they can track, and by the way, so can we if we want, right, they can track those sorts of occurrences to whether they lead to specific outcomes like firings, not necessarily CEOs, but CFOs or others, right, other types of dismissals. Okay? Uh, now, what's, what's kind of the big issue here? The big issue here is, is, you know, some of these things could be simple mistakes and some of these things really could be kind of biasing information uh, to try to prevent uh, senior people from finding out that you're not performing very well. Okay? But, but this is kind of a standard area to look at, and it's the type of thing that I think can actually be explored further. What's actually perhaps more interesting, because remember, that's still kind of more on the hard, yep, thanks. hard information side. On the soft information side, think about situations of, say, CEO misconduct, right? Uh, this could be because of things, you know, usual vices, drinking, gambling, uh, you know, perhaps having an inappropriate relationship, right? These are the types of things that obviously people try to keep hidden, uh, and at least increasingly now can lead to dismissal. And this is something that you people are all done. So you probably have better ways of learning about these things than, than older people like ourselves, uh, which is that you know, a lot of the stuff surfaces on social media. Uh, and so it may be possible to use social media to track misconduct before it becomes more broadly public and or reaches the level of a board discussion. 
And so there may potentially be something to it here. Okay, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to say nonprofits uh, is the last thing that I want to talk about. Nonprofits, I think, are super interesting, uh, and especially commercial nonprofits. So think about things like insurance companies, hospitals, universities. They are very much like profit maximizing uh, organizations, but they're organized as nonprofits. Okay, so they're commercial nonprofits. They don't have no shareholders, they don't distribute profits, they typically have a mission. They oftentimes have multiple objectives. If you think about a hospital, conducts medical research, teaches new physicians, treats patients, does a whole bunch of things. Okay? And nonprofit boards basically can represent a lot of constituencies, right? Physicians, nurses, whatever, uh, some advocates. All right, uh, so there are a lot of specific channels of interest that we can identify and focus on. There's no ownership. Right? There's only control. Right? There are no shareholders. There's only control. Pay performance sensitivity can't be high powered. Right? Because you don't have stock, you don't have options. Right? And the board of directors' fiduciary responsibility is to the organization, not the shareholder. Okay? So this is a great, great laboratory. All right? And you can really highlight the tension between things like monitoring and advising. And last thing I'll just say is termination decisions are going to be the primary drivers of incentives. Okay, so lots of interesting things can be done here. I'll stop here since I'm out of time.